So I uh, wanted to thank the, the praise band. Man, that was, that's fantastic. It's always cool to come here because your music is just brilliant. Just really, really good. Appreciate, uh, appreciate the invitations and certainly greetings from Grace. Um, I, I'll tell you how this deal went. So uh, the word came out that Joey needed somebody to come. And he asked for John, our lead pastor, to come. And John said, no, I'm not, I'm not coming out there. And, uh, and so, they, uh, so, so they went to the, that's the A team. So they went to the B team, that's Jimmy. And Jimmy says, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be on vacation. And so, you know, Joey said, well, surely there's somebody that can speak English that, that can come. And, <clears throat> and nobody raised their hand. He said, well, I guess I'll take Scott. So that's how you got me today. So uh, it, it is, uh, it's, a, it's always a pri- privilege to come back. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 15, if you want to roll there. Matthew chapter 15, verse 21. And before, we, uh, before I read, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for us, and then we'll, uh, we'll get started. Father in heaven, I ask that you give us grace today, that uh, the meditations and uh, and the thoughts that, that come from my mouth would be pleasing to you and helpful to Southside Baptists. I ask that you'd bless them greatly. In Christ's name, amen. Matthew 15, verses 21 through 28. And I'm going to read it slow because these, uh, these are quite scandalous words from our Lord and Savior. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. So, Chinese people can be, on the surface, quite rude. I know this because I lived there for three years. And my job there was to go into the schools, teach English to 50 to 90 students at a time, and then after class, we would we'd go to the teacher's round and lounge and hang out with, with a Chinese English teacher. During one such a, one session, I, I, had, uh, I taught the class, came back and uh, sat down in the lounge trying to ca- you know, catch my breath, you know. And the English teacher came to me and the, she said, Oh, I enjoyed your lesson so much. You remind me of my first American friend. He was much more handsome than you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Very kind of you. During the three years we served there, I heard things like, Oh, you're so fat. Oh, you look very old. You look sick. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. I feel like I need to write you a check. I usually have to pay a copay for, for such truth. But, but to be honest, the Chinese people aren't rude at all. They're, they're the most kind 
and gracious and hospitable people you'll ever meet. But there's something at times that gets lost in the trans, 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 you know, the translation, you might say. So when we see and hear Jesus' words today, immediately we might be taken aback. If anyone else, if anyone else in the scriptures would have said these words, we could have wrote them off and said, whoa, I'm having a bad day. That, 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 are you kidding me? That's not secret, sensitive words. But we know Jesus. We know him. He's gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger. He's abundant in loving kindness. So there must be something else going on. So here's the way we're going to roll this today. Good news is you're going to be out a lot earlier than Joey let you out. So everybody can breathe in, right? So here's how we're going to roll it today. I'm going to go back and retell the story and, and try to get you into the scene and then as we walk through the text, there'll be some applications in the explanations. And then I've got really just, it's going to be a three, two, one deal. So three observations that we gleaned from the Canaanite woman, two observations we gleaned from Jesus, and then one final big picture thing we'll close with. So let's go back and, uh, and, and let's look at the story. Jesus, this, this account finds Jesus in the region of Tyre and Sidon. Now, I am not a New Testament ge geographical expert, so I had to do a little research on Tyre and Sidon. Th this is in Gentile country. So imagine that Canapolis and Concord is the Galilean ministry where Jesus was. Tyre and Sidon is in King's Mountain right it, it's not a it's not a short distance away when there's no ubers or there's no cars or motorcycles it's probably a 25 to 50 miles away jesus probably is removing himself from this the, the controversy that was surrounding him in his his ministry in israel he, even though he obviously was a hundred percent god he's also a hundred percent man and there were times he was tired. He, he, would, he, he was having back and forth with the, the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. There were people that were coming to him, needing healing, wanting to hear from him. There was this whole air of, uh, around him that people thought that he was this, the military Messiah that they wanted. And so he just needed to get away. Perhaps to use the time to, 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 to teach his disciples. But as the saying goes, there is no rest for the weary. And as soon as he reaches the region, he is approached by a Gentile. But not just a Gentile, a Gentile woman. And not just a Gentile woman, but Matthew tells us, She's a Canaanite. Now, for you guys, I know that you're under a wonderful teacher, so you kind of know things, right? So when you hear the word Canaanite, this is the only time that it's mentioned in the New Testament. Perhaps your mind goes back to the Old Testament, knowing that the Canaanites were a severe enemy of God's people. The Canaanites were actually the inhabitants of the promised land, and God told Moses to remove them from the land. So when we notice that Jesus is approached with a Canaanite by a Canaanite woman, immediately perhaps we're thinking, oh my, this may not go well. But interesting enough, this Canaanite woman from a pagan place, from a place that did not have the promises of God, that did not have the advantages that the God's chosen people had, we find something remarkable. Notice in verse 22. Have mercy on me, O Lord. Son of David, 
she is approaching Jesus with his messianic title. In other words, she gets it. It's incredible. In fact, Matthew might put this occurrence in his, in, in, in his, his book likely to juxtapose her faith from the outside with those that are on the inside, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, even the disciples. She's hurting. She's crying out. And Jesus says nothing. But that's not what the disciples said, right? This, this does not paint the twelve in a positive light. They do speak. They go up to the Lord and say, and they, the Bible says they beg him to get her away. Just a quick parenthesis. It, it's, it just shows you that, that even if you're close to the Lord, which of these were, you can still have blind spots, Right? We live in a world where, oh my gosh, it, it, the, 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 the political left, it's just, it's miserable, right? I mean, we, we're trying to, this critical race theory, all this crazy stuff on, I mean, race, it seems like the media is trying to find a, a racist behind every door. It's, it's, it's sad and ridiculous. Yet, sometimes we on the political right or on the, the, the conservative right, Sometimes we go too far as well, right? Sometimes we don't realize that we do have blind spots on things. The disciples certainly had a blind spot here. Their approach was not the best. In that parenthesis, that's not, not what the sermon's about. She does not give up. She continues to, to beg and plead. This time Jesus does speak. I have not only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but she continues to approach him. And this time she falls at his feet. And that's when he drops the bomb. He drops the mic. And it appears that he calls her a dog. What do we make of it? So... I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know. I'm going to offer you two suggestions that I feel comfortable with and I'm confident with, but the truth of the matter is I wasn't there. I don't know. I don't know how the tone was. I don't know what the gestures were. But I have an idea. I can imagine many of you work. And if you're like me, you probably have times when you don't like your job. And, and there are probably times that you really wish you had another job. I feel that a lot. One lives in my home who is a teacher, my oldest daughter. And she is a second grade teacher. And generally speaking, within a week's time, about 198 times she will come home and say, Dad, I hate my job. I'm so sick of the kids. Oh, I can't stand the administration. Oh, my gosh, I can't, pe I can't bear the people I work with. I just, I'm ready to quit. I'm, I'm just done with it. You know, 198 times. For 197 of those times, I'm a really good parent. Baby. Everybody's job's hard. It's difficult. It'll get better tomorrow. I mean, you're a teacher. You get three months off school. Oh, no, sorry. That wouldn't, that wouldn't have been appropriate. I mean, it, it, honey, it's, it's, it's okay. I mean, you get it, and it's, it, it's, it's going to be fine. Don't, don't worry. But then something happens to me when that 198th time hits, and it, the conversation goes a little bit like this. Daddy... I just, I'm, I'm just, I think I'm going to quit. I think that's a great idea. I think you should quit. I think you should quit right now. You, you, you need to just go. 
I mean, it's, I can't believe you stayed this long. It's ridiculous what they pay you. That's a ridiculous school. You don't need to go to, why do we even need to have teachers? Give me your, te- give me your phone. I'll text your boss right now and tell him you're leaving. It's terrible. It's ridiculous. You don't need to pay your bills. Who cares? Quit. Now, have I changed on that 198th time? Is my advice to her different than what it was those first 197 times? No. No. I'm taking a different approach, right? I'm I'm saying the words that she's thinking back to her out loud so that she can hear how ridiculous that they sound. I think this is what Jesus is doing with his disciples. I think that Jesus knows that his disciples are steep into this idea that they are the chosen people and the blessings of God are only for them. And they are just for them. And Jesus is trying to break them free from that idea because he knows that he soon is going to be going to the cross and three days later he will rise again and he will be with them in the upper room and what will he tell them to do? Go therefore into all the nations, teaching, baptizing in my name. He knows that they have to break away from the traditions of what they're steeped in. And so he mirrors the words that they're thinking verbally so they can hear how ridiculous it sounds, especially in the context of a woman desperate for help. But I, but I think there's even a, a, another thing. I, I think Jesus certainly could be placing barriers up in front of this woman so that we can see whether her faith is real. It's, you know, you, you look at me and there, there's no, you, you don't have to wonder if I go to the gym or not, right? I mean, I don't have the body of a person that works out. In fact, I don't think I've seen a gym in years and years and years. But I'm told for those that do go, I mean, Sawyer back there has got guns. I mean, his, le- his arms are bigger than my legs. I mean, so, but I'm told that there's these things, these bands that you can use, and, and, and they're tension bands. And the more you press up, the harder it is. And, and if, you, if you do it long enough, it'll, you'll, you'll have big muscles like, like Sawyer. In some ways, that's what Jesus is doing. He's pressing back on her to see if she will continue on as it looks like it's tough and it's difficult and he seems to be putting these barriers up. But what she's trying to do, he wants her to break through so that her faith could be great. This is not the first time that Jesus has done this, you know, had this approach. Remember in Matthew 19 with the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus puts up a barrier, keep the law. Rich young ruler, he, he, he's trying to work out, he's trying to work. Which laws? Jesus names six of the laws. He just says, okay, do this, do this, do this, do this. Barrier. Rich young ruler says, I've done all that stuff. Looks like he's doing well. Barrier. Then Jesus says, sell all you got and follow me. And it's too much. He leaves the gym. It's too hard. But not the case with this woman. The the tension, the barrier brings out her faith so that we can see it. That's the story. Let's talk, uh, let's go three, two, one. Things that, observations from the Canaanite woman, things that we can learn from her. 
Number one, the woman's circumstances remind us that life is full of troubles. Job 14 says, man who is born of a woman is few of days and full of trouble. I'm, I'm not unaware that everybody in this room is somewhere on the, the pain continuum. You're, you're, you're either, you know, right now things are going pretty well. I mean, I, you know, things are good. I feel good. I'm healthy. I'm good. I'm things good. But there's some of you that might be on the exact opposite end. Things aren't going well. Things are horrible. It's difficult. Life's tough. This woman's pain was very public. I want you to note that. Note that her public response to pain was something that she was not ashamed of. Help me. I need help. She didn't care who hurt her. It, it seems, and it may not be the case at Southside, certainly at Grace, certainly within my family. I, I would say over the last 5, 10, 15 years, there is a change in the way that we approach personal difficulties. We, we are a society that, you know, I, I don't do social media things, but my wife shows me, I mean, on social media, you, you know, you get picture, pe people with pictures of their food that they're eating and uh, the drinks they're drinking and the places they're going. Very public. But when it comes to a personal tragedy or a personal hurt, it seems that we keep those things inside. It seems that we don't share those as often as we used to. The, 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 the church should be a, it should be a resource, a rehab center, if you would, a place where people can come with like-minded people and unload and feel safe and know that they're going to help you heal. But in some ways and in some churches, it's not a rehab center or a hospital. It's a masquerade party. We all come and we, we're wearing masks. And the masks make us look like, oh, I'm the perfect Christian. Everything's going well. I've got 2.5 kids and I've got a good job and great things are happening to me. And we're ashamed or concerned about sharing our needs. Brothers and sisters, I would encourage you. This is the place you come when you're hurting. God's people are there for you. James tells us that we confess our sins to one another so that we can heal. So that we can heal. Second observation. The woman's circumstance reinforces the truth that trials are often a means to which God either strengthens our faith or creates a divine opportunity for faith most of the time we we focus on the first part of that sentence trials are often a means that god strengthens our faith we we go back again to james 1 count it all joy my brothers when you meet trials in various kinds for you know that the testing of your face produces steadfastness but i want you to think with me for a moment about the the, the flip side the other point of that that sometimes trials creates a divine opportunity. This woman's hurting. This woman's pain is not fun. This, this woman has something within her family that is not something that she can manage. She can't deal with it. So she goes public. And she goes public to Jesus. But what if her daughter wasn't possessed by a demon? 
But what if her daughter just had a runny nose or an ear infection or a bad cough? Would she have sought Christ? Maybe, maybe not. Sometimes when we are in the midst of the worst possible trials, the hardest things in life, it's so easy to forget that even those horrible, nasty, rotten things are from God. That he has designed these things, if you're not a believer, so that you will get out of yourself and seek someone else, him. Or if you are a believer, that he will remind you that he can bring you through it. Though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he's with you. It's difficult for a minister to preach hard things about this topic when you're sick and when you're hurting. you got to preach these things when you're well so that when sickness comes and trials come, because they're coming, you can have comfort. I'm not certain... I don't, I, I'm not certain if you're not a believer, I'm not certain how you get out of bed in the morning. No joke. Life's too hard. It, it, I mean, it's just difficult. If I wasn't a Christian, I swear to you, I just, I'll just stay in my, I'll stay in my bed. I, I don't want to face the, 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 the junk in the world. It's too difficult. Things are too hard. Cancer is too bad. Depression is too bad. Family problems too bad. My mother, dementia, dealing with that. It's just too. It's just too bad. I can't bear it unless, unless I know that Christ has a plan. Last thing from the perspective of the woman and this is that the Canaanite woman provides us a great picture of great faith do you know that the adjective great describing faith is only used twice in the New Testament both time Gentiles <laughs> none of the disciples ever get that, that hey your faith's great it was a Roman centurion and the Canaanite woman that's it so somebody, a tactician like Joey Morrison, could take this passage and he could just ring this out for like four or five weeks about how the characteristics of great faith. I mean, because they're all there. I mean, there's tons of them there, right? It's persevering. It's passionate. It's humble. It's action-driven. I'm going to tell you about one. That's it, just one. And, and I think it's the most important aspect of her faith that makes it great. I'll, I'll do it by telling you a story. So, September 15th, I think. September 15th of this year, the Dallas Cowboys will be playing the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in the first game of the NFL season. And I have great faith the Dallas Cowboys will run them off the field and destroy them. I have great faith that the Dallas Cowboys are going to have a winning season. I have great faith that the Dallas Cowboys are going to win their division. I have great faith that the Dallas Cowboys are going to get into the playoffs. I have great faith that the Dallas Cowboys are going to make it to the Super Bowl. And I have great faith that they will be your 2023 Super Bowl champions. There's only one problem with that. The Dallas Cowboys will let you down, people. They have let me down for the last 30 years. So, you see, faith always points to something. My faith may be great for the Cowboys. It's, my faith is not the problem. 
The problem is the cowboys will let you down, brothers. But Jesus will never let you down. The woman's faith is great primarily because it points to the one who will never leave you or forsake you. Two things quickly about Jesus, and we're almost done. We learn from Jesus that God doesn't often answer please in the time we desire. God doesn't often answer our pleas in the time we desire. Now, for the, the story with the Canaanite woman, everything's squashed together, right? I mean, so we see it, and it unfolds really quickly. She pleads. Jesus says nothing. She pleads. She doesn't get the answer she wants. She pleads. She doesn't get the answer she wants. She pleads, and she gets the answer she wants. But that's not the way it always works, right? Sometimes it, 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 it takes longer. Think, think, think about the passage that we read in the Old Testament reading. Abram's promise that uh, his seed will be a blessing, not just a blessing for him, him personally, but, but a blessing for the world. God's told him that he's going to have a son. But, but it doesn't happen immediately. It, it, it's a long wait. The, 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 the best example, in, for, for, at least from my perspective, is, is Lazarus. Remember that story? John 17? The, the Bible says that it, it's, it's, it's crazy the way the wording is. The, Jesus gets word from Mary and Martha. They're a long way off, right? So it's a far way. The word comes to Jesus from Mary and Martha that their brother's sick. And the Bible says that Jesus loves them. And then it turns around and says, and then he waited three days before leaving. Didn't sound like love. Seriously? I mean, imagine somebody comes to you and says, oh, man, I, I need help. My, my car's in the ditch or whatever. I mean, you, you're, you, man, you're going to hightail it over there. Even if you don't like them, you're going to do it. Just because you're good people, you're going to help them. But it's, the Bible says Jesus loved them and then waited three days before he left. Why? Be be because, the, because the wait had purpose. If Lazarus doesn't die, then Mary and Martha are not going to understand when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The, there's, there's purpose in the wait. You, you may be praying for something. You may, maybe have been praying for a need, and, and, and then the Lord has not answered you. I just want to encourage you, don't give up. Keep praying. He loves you. He cares about you. He may delay, but in the delay, there's purpose, and he's building your faith up. The second thing, and I'll just talk about it for just a second, but I, 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 we have to understand that this story just is so wonderful as it portrays that the bread of life is for all people. It's not just for, Christ's blessings are not just for, for Jewish people. They're, they're not just for Americans. They're not for, just for Canaanites, but they're for Koreans and Chinese, Mongolians, Malaysians. They're easy, even for French people. Can you believe that? Final thing, and then we'll close. The story of the Canaanite woman from 30,000 feet portrays the greatest story of them all. Uh, just hear me out on this one. Before Christ, we were separated. 
we were outside the promises of God. The Canaanite woman was separated from the promises of God. Before Christ, we are facing a hopeless situation and one that we cannot solve, namely our sin. The Canaanite woman has a situation that she cannot deal with. There is nothing that she can do. There's no medicine that she can give. There's no anything that she can do to help her daughter. She's hopeless. Before Christ, we're hopeless, outside the promises, in deep trouble. But God, but God, it appears in the story that the woman is seeking God, seeking Christ. But I would like to say to you that I believe that Christ is seeking her. Why did he come to the region of Tyre and Sidon? Was it to get away? Was it because he needed a rest? Because he wanted to get it with his disciples? Maybe, maybe, maybe. But the primary reason is because he's chasing this woman. He's chasing the Canaanite woman. That's what Jesus does. He chases us. He chases sinners down. He chases, he's been chasing since the Garden of Eden when he chased Adam and Eve down after they sinned. And all throughout the Bible, we do not pursue him. He pursues us. And in Christ, we have a chance because he chases us down, irresistibly turns us around so that we gladly seek him. But it's so important to understand that we seek him because he first seek, sought us. And finally, this woman was begging for crumbs off the king's table. But brothers and sisters, as children of God, we never have to settle for the crumbs from the table of Christ. We are seated with him and enjoy a feast of blessings forever and ever and ever if you are here today and you are not a christian i urge you why not trust a god like this why not come to christ he loves sinners and if you're a christian today no matter what you're going through no matter how tough it is you are breathing free air not just because of what our great soldiers have done on this memorial day as we remember but because what christ has done to us to us for us he has paid the price that we could not pay let's pray father in heaven you are so good to us thank you father for saving us Father, for those that are here that may not be saved today, Father, in their heart, they, we let them know that you're chasing them. Father, thank you for all you have done for us. We love you. In Christ's name, amen.